Hello. Good evening, everyone. First, we hope all of you and your families are safe and in good health. Welcome you all to this webinar on use of technology for corporate governance and data risk management. As you're all aware that the current COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted a need for an increased use of technology to enable businesses to function in a world that is highly distributed but digitally enabled. New technologies and innovations will be the order of the day to maintain continuity and better future experiences for all. Moreover, since social distancing, work from home is going to be a new norm, it is vital that businesses continue to maintain their connect with all stakeholders, which can be possible only through use of technology. The objective of this webinar is to understand how governance issues for corporates can be resolved through use of technology, which are risks which arise due to our dependence on technology and steps that should be taken to mitigate such risks. And lastly, how is the financial ecosystem, especially banking, evolving to this new world? My name is Indrapreet Singh. I head the investment banking practice at Incorp India with an experience of fundraising, transaction advisory, conducting diligences, valuations for companies across sectors like manufacturing, healthcare, real estate, logistics, restaurants, and technology. I will be anchoring the session. To introduce our panel, uh, Mr. Devdat Modak is a chartered accountant and a PGDBM from IIM Ahmedabad. He has been a pioneer in developing software products in the legal and financial domain. Over the last 30 years, he's founded ventures like Purex, which is used by thousands of law professionals across forums for law information dissemination. He's also the founder of Excite, a data quality solutions provider in India and is used extensive, extensively by the BFSI industry. As a founder of Akshar Digital, Mr. Devdat has launched products like Bodai, Legilens, and Insider Lens, which help cooperate with paperless board management, secondary compliances, and complying with SEBI's PIT regulations. Mr. Bob Adhil is the founder of Rantonics uh, PTY Limited Australia, which provides patented data encryption solutions to protect against cyber attacks to customers, including energy utilities, retailers, insurance companies, payment processors, government departments, some of the world's largest banks and defense agencies. Mr. Bob Ather is a Bachelor of Engineering Electrical and Computers and an MBA from Monash University, Australia. He's also a certified information system security professional and has a deep understanding of compliance standards such as PCI DSS, PA DSS, GDPR, HIPA and ISO 27001. Mr. Krishnakumar Dharmraj is the Managing Director and Head Transaction Banking, Commercial Banking, South Asia at Standard Chartered Bank. He brings over 20 years of experience in corporate banking and transaction banking products, including trade finance, cash management, and supply chain finance, with customized solution structuring and risk management. Mr. Dharmraj has also been a part of various forums on thought leadership, experience sharing, market analysis, and has frequent interactions with regulators on significant market changes. He is a member of various committees of regulators, intermediaries like SWIFT, service providers, etc. I thank you all for your valuable time. Before we start off, uh, any questions from the attendees during the webinar can be posted on the questions tab, and we will take them up towards the end of the presentation. I would now request Mr. Devdar to take us through his insights on use of technology for corporate governance. Over to you, Mr. Devda. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And let me begin by thanking Inda and Mukov for giving me this opportunity to be with you. I am here on behalf of Akshar. As Inda has already explained about what we do, I think we will go straight into the subject matter of this particular presentation. We are essentially talking in the context of COVID-19, which all of us are going through, and it has brought its own set of uncertainties of a nature that are known as well as unknown, and there is more unknown than there is known. So we need to look at COVID-19 and wonder whether we have a crisis or an opportunity. Although right now, the first thing that stares at us is the crisis of component. 
way back in 2008, and I'm not saying way back in any great distance really. It's just that it happened in about 12 years back. There was a massive financial crisis, global massive financial crisis that originated in the US. And you had the president, chief of staff, Mr. Ram Emanuel, saying something very simple. You never let a serious crisis go to waste. It's an opportunity to do things you think you couldn't do before. Some people did say that, you know, Winston Churchill had said something similar around the time that the winners of World War II were creating the, the UN in the area between 1945 and 1950. But there Sir, are researchers uh, who have said... Mr. Devdan, sorry? you're cracking a bit. Can you just try and be a bit closer to the mic? It might be helpful. Is this better? Is this better? This is much better, sir. Much better. There is much. Okay. So, finally, like I was saying, the researchers have told us that Nicola Machiavelli was the person who you could assign this particular credit to for having said this first, which is never waste the opportunity offered by a good crisis. And COVID-19 has given us all, the whole of the globe, this particular opportunity to not waste a good crisis. We are all going through a lot of turmoil in our lives currently, and there is an expectation that the world is never going to go back to being what it was before the COVID-19 crisis started, which by large majority people will all hold true. There is highly hardly any likelihood that you are going to be able to go back to packed offices, to packed buses, to packed trains, to packed aircraft. That's not going to happen anytime soon. But does that mean that we do not have an opportunity? It does mean that we do have an opportunity. And how do we tackle this emerging situation is something that people of our generation probably have heard of Bob Dylan, who had said people seldom do what they believe in. They do what is convenient and then repent. I think this is the time when we have to clearly look at our situation and decide whether we are going to do exactly this kind of behavior or we are going to do something that is going to change things for us. The opportunity for India, in specific terms, because I'm assuming that my audience is largely Indian, although Bob, who is also going to speak after this, is Australian, as we know. Uh, but our Indian audience is the, is the audience that I'm speaking to. And in the context of the Indian audience, I have this to say that we have essentially, uh, for quite a long time, we have done seldom what is necessary. We as business people have typically tended to look at costs and rather than value. And then we have ended up with a lot more to correct errors. This is something that is true of both normal business activity as well as of compliance and governance related issues. And my task today is to dwell more on the latter too. So I'm going to go there now. We are in India in a particularly advantageous position. If you look at the minority investor protection rank that India commands in the globe's 190 countries that are being studied by the World Bank. We have been ranked fourth, seventh, and 13th over the last three years, which means we are in the top five or six percent of the global 190 countries. And this is thanks to our Securities and Exchange Board of India managing together with the MCA the implementation of corporate law, which is where we get this particular ranking. Contract enforcement, as you can see, which is the name for the judicial system and how the, the world ranks us in uh, judicial efficiency, is not anywhere close to that. We are pretty poor in terms of the judicial system. But right now, we are focused on corporate law and compliance with corporate law and governance which is where the opportunities also lie and the requirements also lie. So let me just move to one more screen on the context again. If you look at us right now, we are number 63 in the world. We have an opportunity that is emerging from what China is going through and what other countries in the world are using to increase their abilities. I've just tried to put together there are some country names over here which are sort of relevant in our context. 
as you can see india ranks 63rd and we have the other countries that we consider relevant to our economic future in this particular screen the screen is going to be shared with you so you can have a look at them again later on but you can see that we are pretty well positioned and we have an opportunity ahead of us which is the positive that we can start with while we move forward now compliance and governance are the two subjects that i am supposed to be speaking about after especially after companies act 2013 compliance has become a critical responsibility of directors much much more so than it was especially of independent directors in the 1956 act as prescribed by the companies act of 2013 there is a board report which is a part of the annual report that mandatorily must contain an attachment which contains the director's responsibility statement where the directors have to certify that the company has devised proper systems to ensure compliance with the provisions of all applicable laws and that such systems are adequate and operating effectively now this this act comes along with fairly stringent liabilities to directors especially independent directors who hitherto were not that responsible earlier it was sufficient for directors who are independent directors to take a certification from the managing director and that would absolve them pretty much of their own responsibilities that situation is no longer holding true all directors are equally liable and there is the possibility of criminal liability while this is a scare because it's something that is there in the law it has not been seen to be enact, acted upon by any of the regulators from either mca or the sebi in any significant measure except in in terms of removal of directorships which is something that we will not necessarily need to go into at this point suffice to say that director's responsibility is a thing to take seriously if you want to serve on the board of a company it is going to mean not just giving of time and application of intellect but appreciating of the responsibilities and liabilities associated digitization therefore is something that we need to be taking seriously it is no longer a nice to have it is a legally required activity digitization of corporate records and corporate submissions has come to stay and it has come to stay for the last 5 plus years so your company secretaries your legal advisors your auditors will all be saying this to you in small measure or large and as you grow larger and as you look for more money from public your responsibilities and disclosures increase and so does the requirement to have digitization especially in the context of covid-19 work from home automation video conferencing vpn access all of these have become what is now being called the new normal although i don't know whether the new normal is sufficed by these particular terms or there is going to be a whole lot more that will emerge and i suspect the latter will hold true we are going to see a whole lot more to happen the new world is emerging after this but it is quite clear that digitization is here to stay and the earlier we get on to that particular activity the better it is going to be for us so let me first of all talk about some very simple things that both cb and mca cb of course applies to only listed companies i do not know how many people in the audience belong to listed companies but listed companies are the larger companies in the country's corporate world there are about 1.4 million companies in the country only about 6500 are listed and to those listed companies is what these regulations apply as you can see sebi has been a little more stringent so sebi's extensions and deadline uh, extensions have all been given uh, up to june end whereas mca has normally extended the bulk of their extensions till september end and some of them till even december the big things to note are very simply all meetings and especially board meetings can be held through video conferencing 
which will allow for social distancing and which will allow for minimization of travel, which is the requirement under the current lockdown, as well as in the immediate aftermath of the lockdown. So we are going to be able to take advantage of technology, and this is something that both the lawmakers as well as the regulators of a large chunk of uh, the business in the country have realized and accepted and allowed for in the activities of the boards and companies that they are supposed to regulate. What are some more of the legal requirements or digital requirements of the current environment? The simplest one that I have got here on the screen is essentially the digital signature certificate. If any one of us is a director, you obviously have to have a digital signature certificate in order to become a DIN number holder. And all related activities to everything that a director does and has to authenticate is used. For that, you are going to have to use a DSC. So it will reduce the cost and time, it will reduce the mobility requirement, it will, reduce, it will increase the data integrity, and it obviously increases the authenticity of the documents. This is stuff that you all know. It just is something that really has got to be emphasized because this is probably the first place where we all come in contact with the digital world as opposed to what we were used to doing earlier. The ink pen is something that is not passe yet, but is clearly being replaced fast. Of course, uh, other statutory compliance is also the MCA has required where companies are required to file reports, applications, and forms using only the DSC, but these are increasingly becoming more and more required than they used to be earlier, which is where, again, digitization is something that we need to adopt faster. Similarly, we are talking about XBRL. XBRL is a language uh, modification system which allows for connectivity between various components of reports that companies file. Typically, it has started with the filing of the annual report, where in the XBRL mode, you are required to file, especially listed companies, all the reports that they file with both the stock exchanges as well as, as, well as with SEBI. Stock exchanges themselves have mandated listed companies to do this. Coming to the insider trading regulations, again with listed companies, we have a very stringent and clearly minority shareholder friendly regulation called the prohibition of insider trading regulations, where SEBI has prescribed the need for what is called a structured digital database, which is required to be maintaining what they call UPSI, which is short for unpublished price sensitive information, which companies generally tend to create within themselves about their operations, and that is normal. For example, the normal UPSI creation that happens once every quarter is the quarterly requirement to disclose results. Those results are going to affect the price of the stock and therefore it is UPSI till such time as it is disclosed to the stock exchanges. There are a lot of other examples that occur about UPSI such as winning patterns, such as construction of uh, new facilities, such as acquisition of new assets, such as creation of new deals between organizations that could affect the company's future more brightly or less, such as winning of suits which basically might lead to or losing a suit which might lead to affecting the price of the stock. All of these are called UPSI and the tracking of the possession of this UPSI with what are called insiders is what is supposed to be done in this software so that these insiders are prevented from trading in the company stock during their possession of this special information which other smaller shareholders are not in possession of. This is exactly the focus of this software and this is exactly the focus of the regulation and as it happens we have a software solution for that but we will not go into that just now. The requirement to make sure that insiders do not trade when they are in possession of UPSI is what has to be kept informed within the SDD and informed to the SEBI and the stock exchanges 
as a regulatory requirement. SEBI's digitization expectations in several other areas are listed here. I can go into them in some detail, and I will go into them for some time. I'm conscious that I'm going to be running short of time. We are already at 16.23. I guess I have five more minutes. Is that correct, Indra? Okay. Yes, sir. So, so, okay. So, SEBI LODR Regulation 13, whatever the requirements are on the screen, one big thing to note is that digitization is something that is expected to make information flow from the more informed to the less informed a whole lot better. And it is in that context that governance and compliance are supposed to be utilized, are supposed to utilize digitization. And that's where SEBI's regulations all come from. They expect large companies who use public money to disclose a lot more about their operations than private companies who use their own funds, who use promoters' funds, are required to disclose to, their, to the outside world. So this is where most of the digitization expectations from SEBI come, and that's exactly why you have a list of them over here. It's going to be shared with you. You're welcome to ask questions a little later also. Let me move to a sort of a broad overview. There are at least 12 mandatory requirements Non-mandatory can be at least three, which is something that your company secretary will be talking about. The increasing complexity of governance and compliance procedures is something that is clearly driving us towards digitization, and digitization is going to help us as well. It's the help that we should be looking at rather than the compulsion, because if we use our digitization initiatives to help with management decision making, rather than focusing merely on the compliance aspects of the story. That is going to be a whole lot more rewarding in terms of the investment that is being made into digitization. Obviously, if there is going to be more and more such compliances required, manpower reliance is going to be a failing strategy because you cannot have human beings who are capable of forgetting, capable of falling in all of these kinds of situations basically the, uh, becoming the dependable component of systems. Digital systems are a whole lot likely to be more dependable. Uh, these are some recent examples of non-compliance. Non-compliance with semi regulations can be very, very painful, as you can see right here, from 22 crores to 8 crores over the last several months. And it is something that is considerably more impactful now, now than it earlier used to be under the 1956 Act. The 1956 Act and related regulations from SEBI were a whole lot less impactful in terms of the quanta of the penalties applicable. But ever since we've had uh, several scams, including Satyam, we have reacted to my mind very, very well, and we have a situation now where the regulators take their regulations seriously, they expect the regulated entities to take them seriously, and people who don't take them seriously are shown that taking them seriously is a requirement. This is something that is obvious from these examples of non-compliance penalties. It's not a scare thing, it's much more a thing that basically should enable us to think that compliance is a part of our cost of doing business so that we can and should be able to continue to accept and take monies from public rather than try to do things in a manner that is uh, not appropriately open to being transparent and responsible. Now let me move from compliance to governance. Governance essentially is the responsibility of the board of directors of the company, which is the final strategic decision making body. And a simple math will tell us that if currently you are serving, if anybody uh, is serving on, let us say, four or five boards, and you all know each board has to meet at least four times a year, they have a minimum of five committees. Each one of those committees has to meet at least four times a year. 
considering that you are serving on five boards and you will be serving on several committees within each board, the likelihood that you will be attending 100 meetings a year is very, very high. In such a situation, more often than not, you have agenda papers that exceed 250 to 500 pages each meeting. So if you have two meetings a week, as is obvious when you have 100 meetings a year and there are 52 weeks in a year, there are like two meetings plus in a week. So the quantum of data that you need to read, digest, and think about before you go to that board meeting is going to be very, very significant. And this does not happen smoothly across the year. As we all know, it is typically going to get bunched up into various parts of the quarter. And that makes life a whole lot more difficult for each director. So to make at least their arms and you know, legs a little more comfortable, it is much, much more easy to transfer this data in soft media on digital paperless meeting solutions of the kind that Akshat does develop. We have a product called BoardEye, which we will talk about when the opportunity presents itself later. But right now, digitized agenda and minutes available to you at the click of a button is going to be far, far more useful is something that I believe is appropriate for me to say here. It also allows the directors to interact with each other to make notes in the fashion that they have been used to doing, in a but with additions in a manner that software will allow. And when you marry online meeting facilities of the kind that we are currently having, because of the size of this meeting or because of the size of the uh, uh, or the distance of the activity that we are conducting, we currently may not be on audio uh, on video, but video meetings are very very possible with with 15, 20 people together conferring on these kinds of platforms. We are talking on the GoToWebinar platform. There are other platforms available, and online meetings in a video conference mode have now become extremely comfortable. And as we saw a few screens back they are now legally permitted. So taking the two things together, it makes the life of the board and the company's executives who have to take instructions from the board a whole lot easier using these tools. <clears throat> let, me, <clears throat> let me just say in summation, the complexity and amount of compliances has increased significantly over the last four or five years. Unless you have a system in place for compliance, the life of the company's directors and executives is going to be a whole lot more complex and a whole lot more difficult than it needs to be. So digitalization will make life easier. Digital, digitalization will also make life a whole lot more manageable and more efficient and effective. And therefore, digitalization for not just compliances, but also for good management decision making is a reason for using digitization. It also fulfills the governance responsibilities of directors using both online meetings and much more than physical meetings and paperless meetings much more than paper book meetings. So using technology for both compliance and governance will not just do these two jobs, but it will also help to make the management decision making of the company a whole lot more efficient and effective. And that's why we need to use technology and digitization to shift from what was possible earlier. Earlier, we were meeting once in a quarter, and both boards would meet, they would converse, and they would part company for another quarter. Today, considering that there is a requirement to keep on keeping track of compliances all through the year, there is need for what is called continuous governance. That is far more easily, if not only possible, through the use of digitization. And hence, I'll try and conclude my talk for now with this note that you know we must shift from periodic tracking and governance to continuous tracking and governance using digital tools that are now completely comfortably available to all of us. I am ready to hand over to Bob. Can I do that in there? Thank you very much. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Devdat, for an excellent detailed presentation. I hope everybody is able to hear me well. Yes, Bob, it's perfect. Thank you. We are, we are seeing a tremendous speed and pace of data being collected, processed, and shared. This is due to growth of digitization of businesses, the use of disruptive technology such as IoT, which allows you to collect millions of data in seconds, artificial intelligence, which allows massive amounts of data to be easily analyzed into meaningful decisions, decision making. And all of this is possible as compute power storage capacity is still exponentially increasing whilst cost is reducing that is the affordability is is becoming easier however cyber threats are increasing and cyber crime is a big industry forecasted to be six trillion dollar industry by 2020 and this will continue to grow Governments are rising to the challenge through regulation to protect personal data with fines and jail sentences. Their, their data privacy standards, such as General Data Protection Regulation for EU citizens, which requires European citizens' personal data to be protected, whether it is in EU or in India, or in any part of the world. HIPAA is another standard, um, mostly in America, for health records, where if you are electronically storing health records, you need to protect that. PCI for payment card industry. Um, if you have credit card data, you need to protect that as well. And in India, we have the IT Act, which, which also, requires you to protect data and soon PDP 2000, uh, 2019, which will be, bring alignment with international standards. Interestingly, um, analysis done by IBM Poneman report of 2019 has shown that the chance of a data breach by company within two years is 30%. So that's a fairly high number. What I'm really saying is people are collecting lots of data about their customers, competitors, businesses, um, you know, the buying habits, their health records, and so on, so that they are able to make better decisions. Despite companies spending millions of dollars in cybersecurity measures, businesses are still getting breached. And these days, people don't go and break into a business or a bank. They actually hire professional hackers to steal data. And you know, um, this is an interesting result that I was able to pick up on the, on the net. And basically, when you look at the data breaches in India in 2019, per Business Insider, this is what I found. So we have some substantial uh, breaches like State Bank of India, 422 million records. And out of that um, was um, 1.3 million credit card. And uh, this credit card was sold at $100 each. We look at Indian Health, 70 million records. Also some very critical infrastructure such as Indian Space, space research organization hacked in 2019, Airtel with 325 million records, Adar, 6.7 million users details leaked in February 2019. It, according to Data Security Council of India, India has been the second most cyber attack affected country between 2016 and 2018. And the average 
cost of data breach is $64 per record. So if you are storing a million records in your IT systems and you are breached, the potential financial exposure is $64 million, which is substantial. Now, COVID-19 disruption has led to an increase in cyber attacks. And um, what has happened is that um, IT systems that were in the data center, you know, typically locked up, are now increasingly being brought online. Employees who um, used to work in a locked room are now working from home. They are now storing, processing, transmitting sensitive data from the home, which is considered to be an insecure environment. So working from home, I believe, is, is not gonna change. Um, I, must ad, I must admit, whilst there is a terrible time for co during COVID-19, there are some lessons for humankind. One of them is our roads are less congested, you know, I, I, from what I read from here, from, from Punjab, you can see the Himalayan mountains, which you couldn't do before. Um, and, and you know what? Um, I honestly believe that post COVID, the world would have changed where the way people will work and do things will be different and we'll see more and more people working from home. I wanna now look at the uh, data privacy standard in India a little bit. Um, and um, the Technology Act has been around since 2000, and over the years, um, more and more regulation has been added to that, where there's compensation if data is breached, and companies need to take reasonable security practice methods to protect the data. And, and these standard has been upheld in high courts and supreme court as well and in september 2016 um, adha act for regulated industry further tightened the security for confidentiality and protecting customer personal information and using it for the purpose that you have obtained that that data unfortunately the personal data privacy enforcement has been poor um, due to high legal cost, long time to win a case. And then you, one has to battle with some powerful enterprises who have lots of legal you know, lawyers in the company. So it is really hard to um, win a case unless you are well prepared and you have enough money and, and you're willing to you know, go all the way to challenge them. The personal data privacy bill of 2019 has been introduced into the parliament in December. And um, you know, this, this data privacy standard is similar to the European GDP, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, due to COVID-19, the government is busy with other things as we all know. Um, but I believe once that's done, um, they will look at this and it will, it will get passed. When we look at GDPR, GDPR is for EU citizens in Europe, and, and it applies to their data stored anywhere in the world. The privacy policy requires that personal, uniquely identifiable data of a EU citizen needs to be protected. So what is a personally identifiable data for an EU citizen. It could be his telephone number, his name, bank account number, IP address. Um, in fact, it's all the data that uniquely identifies the data needs to be protected. And here's the, um, a, a very important point. If the data is breached, the fines are 20 million euro or 4% of your annual revenue. So now, it is a serious um, implication if you do not protect the data. When I look at PDP in India, um, the, there's, a, there's a good alignment 
of the standard um, to, to world wide standards. And um, as I said, it has been introduced to the parliament. Currently, it has been delayed. I believe it will be um, it will it will be approved, you know, when COVID settles down, and it will be implemented in a in a phased manner. Looking at the PDP in more detail, I've looked at the relevant bits that I believe are important, um, and here we look at fines, the criminal liability, and the compensation. And what I've done over here is I've compared it with the the um what i call the um, it act which is currently enforced um and the new pdp and and the first thing you'll notice is the fines previously is about seven thousand dollars but now it's going to be changed to two to four percent of your worldwide revenue so that's substantial the criminal liability is similar three years jail sentences compensation so now um you know, um, people are able to um, um, get compensation for data that has been breached. Here is some examples, um, and I've just, you know, you know, this is just to explain to you how serious the fines could be. Um, so I've, I've looked at an example of a company that's $56 billion revenue. You know, two to 4% is anything from $1 billion to $2 billion. And um, if you look at a $500 million company, the fines are 10 million to 20 million. And if you're a small company with a revenue of 1 million, the fines can be anything from 20 to $40,000. Now don't forget these three years jail sentences as well. Overall, PDP requires you to um, have clear privacy policies. You need to have a reason to to, to collect the data, you need to be able to use it for the intended purpose that you have collected the data, and you must have reasonable security practice to protect the data. That reason, reasonable security practice means best practice. You know, what is, what is you know, recommended best uh, practice to protect the data. There are other applicable laws in India as well. And, um, you know, some of them are sector specific regulations. Um, when, you, when you look at, at all of them, they stress to you that one needs to take care with personal data of citizens and they must take steps to protect the data. And if you do not do that, then the fines are substantial. And we already know that the chance of a breach is 30% within two years. And here are some examples of companies that have um, paid some fines. Um, I've just put, put, put it over here just as an example. And um, I, think, I think you all know that uh, UN Academy has been uh, breached last week and 22 million you know, uh, user records have been compromised. It'll be interesting, interesting to see what happens over time. I want to now look at data um, security and what is considered a good practice. Now, there are many models that I can pick, you know, many different standards like ISO 27001 um, and so on. What I have chosen over here is the standard recommended by PCI DSS. Um, this is for the payment card industry, and it's been put together by Visa, MasterCard, American Express, JCB, and Discover. The nice thing about this standard is it's easier to understand on what is needed to protect your data because it's pres prescriptive. It tells you do this and do that to protect your data. There are 12 requirements, and specifically, they can be broken down in, into these major areas that I'm showing you. The first one is to do with networking firewall. Then there's the antivirus software, um, you know, anti-malware software. There's access control as well. Who is allowed to look at your data? You need to have network monitoring and testing. You need to have some sort of security policy 
and you need to have physical security as well. All of that is needed to protect the data. And at the same time, good security practice requires you to encrypt your data as well. Now, if you were to look at it in more detail, what those measures are, it's interesting to, to break it down into what does it do and what does it not do. So when you look at a security policy, it's a policy that defines procedures for data. It does not prevent data theft. Physical security stops physical access to, say, the data room, but it does not protect anybody coming via a network, um, um, you know, um, doing a software um, attack to steal your data. We then have firewall. Firewall allows good people in and stops bad people from getting through. Unfortunately, ethical hackers have demonstrated that bad people are able to get in and steal your data. The antivirus malware stop software um, stops bad software from running. Unfortunately, some bad software is able to get through and run on systems, and they are able to steal your data. Access control stops people from, um, you know, sorry, authorized people to access data they should be seeing. Unfortunately, you can copy at volume level the data so you are able to access the data. Similarly, network monitoring just does monitoring but does not stop data theft. When it comes to encryption, encryption makes the data unreadable from bad people. Unfortunately, encryption does not stop people from taking a copy of the data, but encryption does maintain an encrypted data. In other words, a person who has stolen the data is unable to read the data. When we look at encryption in a little bit more detail, encryption is a mathematical process that takes a readable data. And as you can see over here, hello there and how are you today is a readable data. And it's converted to ciphertext or encrypted data so that only the authorized person at the other end who has the decryption key is able to decrypt the data. The thing is this, when you look at companies, they are all extremely busy protecting the data. And they are doing things that are not so important. They are very busy, um, when you go back to this model over here, they are very busy with their firewall, the antivirus software, access control, and so on. And when you ask them, are you protecting the data? They will always say that, they, yes, they are protecting the data. What are you, but are you really doing something to the, to the data? And they'll say, no, they are not encrypting the data. Um, and so kind of what Visa, MasterCard, Amex, you know, um, have emphasized is that while Perimeter security is important. It is a misguided priority when protecting data. And they have stated that encryption is your last line of defense when all other measures fail. So in other words, what I'm really saying is that a company that only encrypts the data is more secure than a company that has everything else. Let me put it another way. If you've encrypted your data, you are protected, even if your firewall is breached. When it comes to fines, for example, if your firewall is breached, you will not be fined. If you suffer ransomware attack, you will not be fined. However, if you have compromised your data, you will be fined. If I was to put that in an, another way, if you, if you have encrypted your data, and you suffered a, a compromise of your um, environment and your data, in other words, you've been hacked, you are able to easily satisfy the regulators by saying that, yes, we were hacked, but the data was encrypted. At the same time, you are able to easily satisfy the customers. When you look at the um, GDPR regulation, for example, HIPAA, 
standard, um, they talk about if your data is encrypted, then the, the financial penalty is removed. The problem is that people are spending millions and millions of dollars in cybersecurity measures. And when it comes to encryption, they know that it's needed, but they are slow to um, encrypt the data. And part of the reason has been that it, historically and still today, people are offering a hardware-based encryption technology and a hardware-based encryption te technology means that it's proprietary solution. It requires software code changes. If you need to do software code changes, then you, you, you need you know lots of people to maintain systems, um, run systems, build policies. Kind of overall, the encryption process is intimidating, hard, and difficult. What I've done over here at Rantronics is. As, as, as a founder of the company, I've actually listened to customers after doing 100 deployments and I have made encryption easy. What I'm doing to encryption is what Apple did to iPhones, make it easy and add features. So now the software runs on a Windows or Linux platform, requires no software code changes. A non-technical person who understands say Windows and Linux is able to deploy policies and encrypt the data. And that's the innovation that I have brought and we are now seeing lots, lots of customers starting to use that. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I wanna now hand back to um, Inga Preet. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bob. Uh, I would now invite uh, Mr. Krishna Kumar uh, to give his insights on challenges in banking during COVID-19 and how technology is helping overcome such challenges. Uh, Mr. Krishna Kumar. Hi, good afternoon. Hope all you are doing good. This is Kumar Dharmaraj, uh, and nicknamed as KK. I will go straight into my topic as introduction is already done by Inda. Uh, let me start with a, a real life story. Uh, uh, it was a hot sunny day in a small town in Uttar Pradesh when I was on a market visit as a marketing manager of an FMCG company. Most of the wholesalers operate on thin margin. However, their way of working defied everything what I learned in management. I was sitting on a stool sipping a cup of coffee. I noticed a 15-year boy manning the store in the absence of his father. I was in a good mood, so I decided to give him some commercial advice. You know, uh, uh, we management guys always try to give advice to others. So I was telling him, you shouldn't be selling products so cheap by only keeping half a percent margin you will soon go out of business, I said. The young boy smiled. He said, sir, I don't think you understand. I make a lot of money from your products. Let me explain. I sell on cash. I have about two weeks of stock, but I also get a week's credit from your distributor. This means that I essentially have a net investment of one week. My investments rotate 52 times in a year with a half a percent margin on each rotation. I make 26% return. It means an ROI of 26%. He spoke with the kind of attitude usually expected from a VC funded entrepreneur. I was really stumped. It was nothing short of an eye opener. What the uneducated young man taught me was how money is made by rotating money and not by absolute amount of money earned in each transactions. These are not my words, but a narrative experience of a leader in a big FMCG company. What this story teaches, which is very relevant at this time, where uncertainty looms, we are all looking for solutions to piling problems and less thinking on what next. In such a time, don't let vanity come in the way. Important life lessons can come from anywhere. This is the time to put all our minds to look at emerging opportunities. What a silver lining emerging in the COVID-19 situation. I'm seeing many sectors are seeing overactivity. You will be surprised. Many sectors, name a few is say home office equipment. 
uh, over activities happening, a lot happening because of all of us work from home. So home office equipment is gearing up a lot. Delivery services, the e-commerce is, is evolving a lot. The penetration is going to be too big. So the delivery services companies are working overnight to build their capacity. Post COVID, everyone want to resume their offices, factories, homes. Cleaning services is becoming going to be big in demand. Remote applications, I don't have to say what we do, webinars, etc. Remote application is going to be a big one. Home fitness, everyone is waiting to lift the lockdown so that they can go buy home fitness equipment. Cyber security, I don't have to tell. Bob has explained in, in detail. Home entertainment and gaming, this sector is also evolving a lot. So we are seeing a lot of action happening in these sectors. Technology capability is getting built, upgraded to cater to the volume growth expected. All of us can emerge, can consolidate, can get into newer fields, but above all, you can participate in the re-emergence at an early stage if you are ready with your plan. So what you look for, hold ro what role you play in the ecosystem? Who is going to compete post-COVID with you? What are you headed for? What cost to incur to get the business back on track? Finally, is it bankrupt or market leader? This is what the thinking around, many of them have already started thinking in this aspect. If I take one example out of this, if I take ecosystem, each sector, each company has their ecosystem, be it a supply chain ecosystem, financial ecosystem, technology ecosystem, et cetera, et cetera. If you peel it off, each ecosystem, there is an opportunity which you can leverage. The questions to be asked, how to be part of ecosystem of growth sectors? What is your plan to bounce back? How culture and identity changes? And how prepared to execute your plan? So there comes what banking sector is experiencing in this pandemic situation. So pre-pandemic itself, if you see uh, uh, India, uh, uh, particularly uh, the financial infrastructure, government of India, um, as well as various regulators of India are doing a lot on digitization. Our payment infrastructure is one of the very matured and leading infrastructure, infrastructure even among the developed markets. So today, with what is emerging in banking, if you ask me, a lot of companies are looking for API use cases. How can I get connectivity real time? What are the various other use cases I can use? So API is one of the very critical aspects everyone is looking for, and it is it is fast evolving in many corporates. So banking and the banks are overnight doing uh, API use cases. They are developing their products, including we. Digital adoption is increasing significantly. Our digital penetration is quite high, but the current situation accelerate this agenda. The third important aspect I am seeing is the dynamics of change happening is too fast during this epid pandemic situation. Every day the position changes. So the clients are looking for trusted partners. They are looking for a person who we can, they can pick the phone and talk on various issues which is emerging. And bankers can play a very important role which we are now playing very proactively. So they are looking for a trusted partners. The companies are building their liquidity to meet any events. Most of the companies or all of the companies, small, big, large, all are conserving cash. They are all creating a lot of liquidity pools so that any kind of events, any kind of long-term impacts they can manage. Companies, very, very novel way, the companies are want to support their ecosystem because they believe that their this ecosystem which i explained earlier is the backbone of their business they don't want to die this ecosystem 
so they are approaching banks how you can support this ecosystem how i can you can support my suppliers how i can support my buyers lot is happening on this space trade cycle if you see maybe extended both buyers and suppliers will lead to an extended credit terms banks are providing all support to ensure smooth functioning of customers financial requirement through a lot of simplification of operational process through digital channels finally if i if i if i talk about what standard chartered bank is offering and what is it all about pre pandemic itself uh, 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 we are looking at and we are doing a lot of digital banking solutions and very very four large themes are emerging which is applicable in the pandemic situations as well one is customers are looking for visibility the need for better view and control of data this is very important as real time banking data is required for companies and customers for decision making very important decisions are made by this data so they are looking for visibility of their banking operations on a real time basis to improve cash flow forecasting what are the ways bankers can digitally support in providing cash flow forecasting and minimize idle funds in the era of funds crunch there cannot be any idle funds so how to minimize idle funds how can i forecast effectively on a real time basis this is another digital solution on a visibility factor it is coming and finally all corporations are looking for a single interface for a complete view of their entities in india as well as across geographies so one clear theme which we are providing and we are building more and more capability is providing visibility on a real time basis the second part is real time banking access any time anywhere because today's new norm is accelerated this thinking so how a company can pay receive funds any time irrespective of banking hours fortunately india payment infrastructure is geared up to meet all these things so the banks are able to provide their products and build the technology solutions to connect with the customers and leverage the clearing system effectively real time information not only affecting payment the customers also want their counterparties getting information on various payments made integrating their erps with banks and that too through api so that real time data management can be done so the second very much theme is coming is real time the third one is coming and it is fast emerging in this situation is cost efficiency how can i drive cost efficiency again this is absolute importance not only during pandemic before also but after pandemic it is it is increasingly getting attention how to reduce cost and wastage in all aspects of financial ecosystem how to free man hours for financial activities which is not adding value to the business how we can use technologies like ai and blockchain to provide solutions so these are some of the products which we are driving which helps the clients and reduce the cost of idle funds so the third important theme is drive cost efficiency through digital channels finally the corporates are looking is how to transact securely with the bank so uh, my two speakers before have lot expressed what important the security is required on transacting and connecting so that connect is the second or the last aspect the customers are looking operational efficiency without compromising on security need secure way to integrate with banking systems like host to host api etc and limit dependency on external systems and how if at all an external system is done how to integrate safely securely without compromising on data so the fourth theme emerging is how to transact securely with the bank which also we are giving so basically to summarize what is emerging in 
banking sector and what we as a bank is is offering and continuously building solutions in this pandemic environment is providing visibility providing real time solutions cost efficiency and connect securely these are some of the themes which i thought of sharing with you happy to he hear some questions uh, if at all you are posting thank you for listening to me thank you thank you mr kumar i'll quickly take up a few questions we are running short of time so i'll try and filter them uh, mr devdat a couple of questions for you hello yes the first question yeah is, how easy or difficult is it for companies to roll out digitization for governance measures to use of platforms like zoom etc for a board meeting on a vc okay so digitization obviously as you know is going to be a whole lot more than merely holding video conferences so however it is clearly going to be critical to have online meetings as a facility because physical distancing being a requirement you do need to have zoom or go to webinar kind of uh, screen sharing and uh, video conferencing facilities they are ridiculously simple to implement in a in a sort of a time sense there is a simple matter of talking to the supplier and actually getting into a subscription mode and the, the the video conferencing capability can be implemented in a matter of days similarly you can implement uh, paperless meeting kind of solutions also as quickly as maybe in within a week or 10 days dovetailing the two is what is going to be the final requirement which also can be done in a matter of 2 to 3 weeks why i am saying this is like this the government and uh, cb both have empowered companies to hold meetings on video conference or audio conference and the big requirement that they have together with that is that for the purpose of keeping track of what happened the record of these meetings has to be kept and retrievable it should be retrievable very very simply post the event so what needs to happen is for example what bodai does which is that you have a paperless meeting where agenda papers are shared and you have minutes being shared all across on the web with no activity of paper happening there and when you have a board meeting happening on video conferencing the recorded tape thereof is something that we can encode operate into the product so that at a later stage should any board member or the company secretary require to look at contents of that meeting it should be possible in the click of a few buttons to be able to retrieve the relevant content and this is all possible within a matter of 2 to 3 weeks did i answer the question yes sir just to follow up on that how how costly or how i mean how can smaller companies or private companies affect such tools okay so the, actually compliance is obviously lesser at for smaller companies board meetings are also capable of being implemented for smaller companies we do not have to acquire you can share you can utilize shared capabilities and thereby reduce costs but equally for both msmes as well as for large companies there are models which are flexible which will allow you and i have discussed this in the resume uh, we have models which will allow companies which are much smaller instead of owning software they can hire software so that their requirements are met and they pay for use or pay as they use rather than paying for ownership or paying for annual license am i making sense yes yes No, understood. Thank you, Mr. Devdar. One. Questions for Thank you, you. Uh, Mr. Asher. Thank you. Thank you. At at what stage, Bob, do companies need to move from you know typical cyber security options like antivirus or firewall to a more sophisticated option like encryption? 
Um, that's a very good question. Um, companies are already spending millions of dollars in cybersecurity measures. IT staff are very busy updating cybersecurity you know, measures. The, the unfortunate part is despite all of these, data breaches are still continuing. So clearly something is wrong. Our analysis has identified companies are busy in the wrong areas and are wasting budget and resources. So most are spending their money on updating firewalls, updating antivirus software, um, et cetera. And, and the reason is that due to lack of understanding or they are too busy with current projects and priorities to do anything else. They typically forget that ethical hackers have already proven they can easily break through the firewall. And they already forget, you know, the world's most powerful, powerful financial organization like Visa, Amex and MasterCard are stating that unless you have encrypted your data, you are still naked. In other words, you can, you are still exposed. So my, uh, my kind of recommendation to all companies, because they are already spending money on cyber security right now, is to stop your data security person from updating the firewalls or updating, you know, any policies or procedures, get him to change the priority. The budget already exists to encryption. And once that's done, then go back to what you were doing. Does that answer the question? Yes, Bob. And and how much should companies ideally be spending on, on such cybersecurity solutions as a thumb rule? Right. Um, that's another good question. And, and kind of the reference I would like to use for this would be the analysis done by Deloitte last year. And according to Deloitte, a company should spend anything between 0.2% nine percent of the annual revenue on cyber security measures so if you are a hundred million dollar company as an example this equates to two hundred thousand dollars to nine hundred thousand dollars per annum on cyber security measures now on average that is about 0.45 percent or four hundred fifty thousand dollars on encryption itself we would see people spending 30% of that amount, which is equating to $135,000. So really, um, it, you know, on cybersecurity, 0 0.2 to 0.9% and approximately 30% of that on encryption. That'd be the, the model that has been recommended by Deloitte. Understood, understood. Thanks, Bob, that's very, that's very helpful. Uh, last couple of questions to Mr. Krishna Kumar. Uh, no. Yeah, yeah, and sir, is uh, what do you feel are the areas in which technology will change the way banking is conducted uh, given COVID? So, uh, see, the digital adoption will increase significantly, which we are already seeing. See, the the, the many fence sitters uh, uh, they don't want to go into digital mode uh, for many of the corporate products. Uh, is already adopting digital and this experience which is long enough now if the client experience is good and they will continue to go into digital permanently so digital adoption is increasing significantly and it will increase further the banking transaction documents will go digital and many products will evolve to meet this need because the transaction documents can be many uh, within a country, cross-border documents, etc. This will go digital and new ways of doing will emerge. And the finally, new way of customer, see banking is customer. New way of customer engagement will emerge through digital modes because we have to meet customers and customers has to meet banker face to face. So there will be a new way of customer engagement will emerge definitely. Yeah, that makes sense. 
yes, just link to that, sir. At, at SCB, what are the innovations you are doing to ease credit, keeping social, distan social distancing norms at the forefront? So, uh, in Standard Chartered Bank, we have a, a robust front end channel. Uh, we call it Straight to Bank and Straight to Bank Next Bank, which offer digital solution to corporate to transact with the bank. This also you can get all relevant MIS, open solutions, etc. Most of the corporate products can be available using digital channels. So we are evolving, we are developing products, which is many of the corporate products already have digital channels. And we are continuously adding new products as well as strengthening the digital channel so that the client experience is seamless and they can operate without any problem and they can get whatever they want when visiting a bank they can avail from the digital channel so channel improvement product development is what we are doing uh, continuously thank you thank you so with this we would like to conclude uh, this session i would uh, once again thank all the panelists and all the attendees for taking time off and being a part of this webinar I hope this was useful to all. Uh, we will be sharing the presentation and the FAQs with the answers shortly. Uh, very happy to receive your feedback. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you so much.